Welcome to the OCC Podcast. Whether you're listening to this at home, on the road, at work, or in the gym, we're so glad you decided to join us as we study God's Word together. We hope and pray that through this ministry, you will grow in your relationship with God as well as become a chair for disciple maker. But for now, sit back and let us help you see how the Bible applies to your life today. If only. My lifelong dream. <laughs> Thank you. First time I've ever been a conductor. It's very, very exciting for me. Good morning. We are so, so glad you're here with us today. My name is James. I'm the lead pastor at OCC. And so thank you for those of you who showed up here in the room. Thanks for those joining us online. Want to make a, a real quick commercial announcement. Tomorrow night here at 7 o'clock, we'll have our annual meeting, kind of a business meeting that by our bylaws we have to have. But we turn ours into a little bit of a party. So if you've never been, <laughs> please come and you'll get to hear from all the staff, hear from the pastors and the things they're excited about God doing and hear a financial report. That's a good, good time. So we take this time every year when we do our annual meeting and we kind of pause through the series we're walking through and we spend some time talking about something that I'm super passionate about, something that I kind of get geeked up about and it's our purpose and our mission and our vision. And I know sometimes it's hard to sit and listen to somebody else that's really excited about something. It may not be something you're as excited about. So I hope by the end of this, you're going to be as excited as I am. It's hard, isn't it, to sit around people who are excited about stuff that you're not excited about at all? I understand. Um, so, so that being said, uh, I mean, is that, has that happened to you before? I, I remember it was funny. I was thinking about it this week, and I hadn't thought about it in years and years and years. I'm not a math person. That's like not my deal. I married into that, and that's fantastic. But, but I'm not that guy. And so I remember taking math classes in high school and just being lost, right? Like I, just, I wasn't tracking whatsoever, especially algebra and calculus. Like my brain just doesn't work that way. But geometry, and my wife tells me this is a real thing, is kind of a different philosophy. And, and like geometry made sense to me. I did understand a little bit of geometry, and I liked solving the proofs and stuff. I still wasn't passionate about it, Right? And I had a teacher in high school, Mrs. Schneidtree, and she was passionate about geometry. And I remember one day she's standing in front of the class, and if you're as old as me, you remember this, she was working on the overhead projector. If you have a smart board in your room, just don't pay attention. You don't even know, know what this is. But she's working on the overhead projector, and she's working on this proof, and like it was hard even for Mrs. Schneidtree, right? Like she was kind of stuck, but she wasn't going to give up. Like <laughs> She was committed. She was in. And she lost the entire class. She lost everybody early on, right? And, but, but like I was paying attention because she was so fired up. She was trying this and trying that. It wouldn't work. And finally she got it. And I'm not, I'm not lying. It took her like 10 minutes. And finally she got it. And she did this. Woohoo! <laughs> like she, <laughs> she was super excited for herself, you know? <laughs> and she was just giddy and she was dancing a little bit. And I'm not going to do that because I got a bad leg and I can't dance. But, but she, she was really passionate, right? And she said something that, that resonated with me, and I thought about it this week. She's like, don't you just love that, right? When you're working on something so hard and you finally get the answer. You know? And I was like, yeah, I'm with you, you know? <laughs> but then she kept talking, like Brenton, when he was trying to explain, <laughs> explain the offering. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> but she's like, has that ever happened to you? Where like in the middle of the night, you wake up, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and you wake up, and you've been working on a math problem in your head, and all of a sudden you solve it, and you're so excited? Yeah, that's what the room looked like. Too. Like no one was like, oh yeah, that's me. But, but that's what she was so passionate about. She was so excited. And while I didn't track with her on solving the math problem in the middle of the night, I did love the passion that she had, right? I never got it myself. Like I said, I did marry it, so that's fantastic. My wife still gets giddy over solving math problems. When I sit at night and I'm watching a basketball game and playing golf class on my phone, she does Sudoku. And then like when she solves one, she, hee, she makes that noise. Hee, hee. And, then, and I get happy for her. Because, because I could never figure it out myself. So if you're newer to Orchards Community Church, if this is not your home church yet, I hope what you see today is some of the passion that I have for this. I hope tomorrow night at the annual meeting you see the passion the staff has for this. And maybe some of that will rub off on you a little bit. Because that's what we want to do. We want to be used by God to kind of spur everybody on to love and good deeds. Because what we're trying to do here at this local church is join God. So if you grabbed an outline on your way in, we're going to talk about how these things work for us. We're going to talk about our purpose and our mission and our vision. And I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon about those things. They are very interconnected. They're different in their own way. But because we want to be a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, because we want to be led by the Lord, we kind of really believe God has given us a specific purpose, mission, and vision. They're still pretty broad, still pretty general. Let's look at our purpose statement first. Here at OCC, you've heard us say this, 
We want to help people become relationally connected. We want folks to be together, right? And we use that terminology very intentionally because we were created in God's image and God exists in relationship. I don't know how much we think about that quite often, but he's three in one, right? He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So God exists in relationship. So we're not supposed to be alone because God isn't alone, right? So when you hear us talk about relationship all the time, we're not just talking about with one another. That part's really important, but it's kind of a two-way street. First, we have to have our vertical relationship right. We want folks to be relationally connected to God through salvation, right? That's the most important thing we can talk about, the, the most important eternal relationship ever. But then once we have that relationship secured, you probably noticed sitting in this room today, you didn't profess faith in Jesus and get whisked up to heaven. What happens? You, you stay here. God leaves us here. Why? Well, there's a bunch of reasons, but one of them is to practice these relationships. <laughs> now we get to practice relationships horizontally with all the people God puts in our path. And so that's a beautiful part of that relationship thing. We have to understand by God's grace through faith, once we profess faith in Jesus, we are saved, right? Then once we are saved, we get to put a premium on being relationally connected to other people. And that's why you hear us talk so much about things like small groups here at OCC, the rooted groups that we have an opportunity, men's, women's Bible studies. There's tons of great men's and women's Bible studies that meet throughout the week. You can get on the website and check those out. That, that may be a place for you to be connected. One of the big things we talk about is service opportunities. That's huge for us. We have tons and tons of ministries, kids, youth, library, gathering grounds, working back in the sound booth, worship team. We have all these places where you can get in and not only use gifts God has given you, but get relationally connected. Connections are so important for us. The last staff hire that we made, my buddy Forrest Jenkins, who was up here helping with the benevolence offering, we hired him into a position we'd never even had before. You know what Forrest's title is? He's our connections pastor. That's how sold out we are to this, right? Because of our purpose statement. Now, here's what a purpose statement truly does, not just for the church, but any organization that has one. It defines why it exists. Sometimes that's how we say ours. We say we exist here at OCC to help people get relationally connected. And, and again, that points to the two-way street kind of thing because if we were just about horizontal relationships, we could be a social club, right? We could get together and play bunko and go on motorcycle rides and go to the movies and all that stuff would be great. But the vertical relationship is first for us. And that's what makes us a local church, connected to God, connected to one another. But if we're going to help people to do that, we have to have a strategy. We can't just talk about it, right? We, our purpose statement helps define why an organization exists. A mission statement gives us a strategy. It explains what an organization is going to do and for whom, right? Now, mission, for some people, that's kind of a scary word. I might have freaked some of you out right now, like, hold on, are we on mission together? Like, are we going on a short-term mission trip, right? Not exactly. It's actually more challenging than that. We're going on a long-term mission trip. <laughs> mission in the church is really supposed to be kind of this big, broad umbrella term that covers every part of our lives. It's a big, big call. One of the best textbooks I bought during the course of my seminary education is a book called Advanced Strategic Planning. Have you guys read it? real page turner, but, but <laughs> I'm not lying. It's a fantastic book. It was written by a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary named Aubrey Malfers, but he gives a great definition of mission. He says it includes five characteristics. To have a, a true biblical mission, it should be broad, brief, biblical, stands to reason, and it's a statement. You'd be surprised the number of mission statements that don't read as a statement, but the most helpful one is the fifth one. It says a mission is what we're supposed to be doing. Helps define that. And so that's how purpose and mission are interconnected. Purpose kind of bleeds into mission. We say we exist to foster relational connections, so what are we going to do? How are we going to engage in that way? Because mission is very much an action word, right? We get that. Mission is the thing we give our lives to. So no, we're not going on a short-term mission trip together, although you should. <laughs> if you haven't been on one before, I think they're great. I love them. I love that we offer them here. I've been on one. I've been on several. Here's the thing. If you want to go, it's a great way sometimes, I think, for God to kind of unpack and unearth maybe what your spiritual gifts are, help you figure out how to use them. But here's the difference between a short-term and a long-term trip for me. 
A short-term trip doesn't necessarily radically change the course of your lives. I remember the last short-term trip I went on, just as the first several short-term trips I went on, I promised myself I was going to learn to speak Spanish. Do I speak Spanish? No, I do not. <laughs> I barely know how to ask where the Banos is, and that one's pretty important. And so, <laughs> but, but every, every short-term trip I've been on, I was like, I'm going to do it, and I didn't do it, right? What do I do when I go on a short-term trip? I activate that email thing that says out of office for a week, and I call and make sure AT&T covers my texting while I'm gone. Like, that's it. Like, I don't make radical changes to my life. In a long-term mission, we do, right? And again, God could use a short-term trip to help you see where you're supposed to be in full-time missions, but full-time missions is your whole life. I have friends who serve as foreign missionaries. I have friends who are full-time missionaries here in America. But the overwhelming characteristic that defines what their life looks like is that they quit doing whatever it was they were doing and they changed their lifestyle. They sold stuff. They relocated. They actually learned the new languages. So their day in and day out life looks radically different because of that decision they made to join God in full-time mission. Now here's the part where if you've been tuning me out, I'm going to say something and I hope this doesn't scare you. But if you consider yourself part of this church, Like if people would ask here in town and you'd say, oh yeah, Orchard's Community Church, that's my church. If you call yourself a member here, you have already agreed in principle to be on mission with us. Do you understand that? We have a mission statement that calls for us to be involved in what God is doing. And discipleship is the driving force. That's what our mission statement is here at OCC. We want to be used by God to make disciples who make disciples. That's it. It meets all those criteria I mentioned earlier. It's broad, it's brief, it's biblical, it is for sure a statement. But most importantly, it's what we're supposed to be doing. And you see how it's connected to our purpose. If we're going to make disciples, what do we have to have first? A relationship with the Lord. We have to be a disciple, right? The only part that's really tricky about our mission statement is that we can't do it. We can't make disciples, right? (laughs) God is the one who makes disciples. So it really points also to our vision. We're joining God as he does this incredible work. That's how all those things are connected. It's actually what we saw from the Apostle Paul last week in Corinth. Do you remember in our passage? He was wanting to head out of Corinth, and God said, no, I got a bunch of people in that city. But I'm not going to save them. You, Paul, you go share the gospel. And that's how I'm going to draw them to myself. That's the part we get to do as a church. I get very, very excited about that. So I hope that's what we're investing in is these discipleship relationships. I hope that we understand the challenge for each and every one of us is to be full-time missionaries. We're supposed to be all in with that notion of, of following the mission God gives us here. And so to help us illustrate that, and I, I try to do this every time I can make it fit in a sermon, I bring these four chairs up here because this is the model that we use. This is the picture of discipleship making that we try to launch out to people. And you'll notice very intentionally it starts here with people who are lost. Now, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot or make you raise hands or whatever, but how many of us have relationships with lost people? How many of us have friends, family members, coworkers that we know don't know Jesus? Well, that's where this chair has to start. Have we lamented that in society? Oh, there's so many folks who don't know Jesus. Have we ever asked, hey, am I supposed to be the one to tell them? Has God put that person that's on my heart in my path so I can be the one to share the gospel with them? It's a pretty big challenge, but, but that's why we start here. And obviously the idea is that person will be saved by God, not by us. I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. But if we share the gospel with them and they profess faith in Christ, what happens? They move to this second chair. The believer chair, pretty important, right? Because in the believer chair, we have that eternal relationship secured. We're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. That's fantastic. It really is. But there's two more chairs, <laughs> It's not the end of our journey by any stretch of the imagination because once somebody gets to this believer chair, God wants us to have abundant life and that abundance comes in joining him in work. That abundance comes in figuring out why he's given us spiritual gifts and what we're supposed to do with them. And so that leads us to this third chair. Can we help as a local church encourage people to say, hey, could you help out in kids ministry? Could you help out in gathering grounds? It doesn't matter where it is. Do you have a passion? Do you have something God's pressing on your heart? Do you have a gift that God has specifically given you to use for ministry? And then you'll join God in this worker chair. And again, that's fantastic. And and, and seriously, you want to celebrate that, each and every step of the discipleship-making process. But there's one more chair. 
And the idea is that if a God is using this, us this way to help people move through this model, we'll eventually land here in the disciple-making chair. And that's when we're like my geometry teacher in high school. We wake up at 3 a.m. thinking about somebody who's in one of these chairs behind us. And we're praying for that person. And we're like, how am I going to reach out to that person and help them move along? Because here we can literally circle back to any one of these chairs, right? That's the beauty of that. Now we're involved in that disciple-making process. And I love the picture that we get from that. So, so that's fantastic. But, but the whole idea here is this helps us understand what mission is. And sometimes we get confused on that. Here's some things mission is not, okay? And this might help us. Mission's not our job. Like, I'm a full-time pastor. That's my job, but that's not truly my mission. I'm going to give an illustration later where a pastor is a pastor, but it doesn't do a great job of being on mission, right? Disciple-making is the mission. And the way you know your job is not your mission is that God may call you to some kind of mission, and you quit your job, your mission is going to still continue. I used to have a job that I loved. Those of you who know me and know my testimony, I owned and, and operated a sporting goods store for years, for 16 years. I loved that job. But God put me on mission, <laughs> and so I left that job. You may or may not have to leave your job. That's fine. Sometimes you can do your mission at your job, and I think that's fantastic when you do that. But mission is not our job. It's also not a particular role we have. Sometimes I've heard that, and I, and I think it's super well-meaning. Well, you know, I'm a wife, I'm a husband, I'm a mother, I'm a father, whatever. That's my mission. We'd love to make role our mission, but what's the problem with that? that's our mission, it could be accomplished, and then I'm done, right? If I say raising my children is my mission, this summer I'm having a party because woohoo, my, my last kid's heading off to college, and I'm going to play a lot of golf or pickleball if I could ever learn to walk again, right? It'd be fantastic, right? My boy Trace is our last one at home, and so when he leaves, am I done with my mission? No. I'm done with that specific part of my role, but I can't say raising my kids is my mission because that fails the Aubrey Malfer's mission test. It's not broad enough. I need to do more than just raise my kids, right? And if you're a parent, you're called to raise your kids, and we've done the best that we can. Dear goodness, we feed them. You've seen Trace. He's jacked. You know, so, so, so it's not like we're not feeding them, like we're doing that part, but, but we want to do so much more. I don't want to just raise my kids, and then the job is done once they don't live in my basement anymore. I want to disciple my kids so they can grow to be more like Jesus. That part doesn't end once they leave my basement, right? I got a call this week from my oldest boy, and it made me cry, but I didn't cry in front of him, so I felt pretty good about it. But, but he, he called, and he's in a master's program over in Seattle, and, and he got me on the phone. He was like, hey, Dad, I need to ask you to do something you haven't done for me in a while. And I thought, he's going to ask me to pray for him. He's gonna, <laughs> and he said, can you proofread a paper for me? I was like, oh, man. <laughs> and I proofread the paper for him because I've done that for all my kids all along. I, I got none of the math stuff and all the English stuff, so, so I help with that. My wife's doing physics with my daughter right now, and I'm like, good luck. <laughs> Maybe she'll have a paper for me to read, and she did that week. So, but, but that's the deal. That's raising my kids. Discipling my kids is a different story. And, and I, I cried a little bit about it, but I mean, here's the thing about my oldest boy, Gavin. He knows that I'm praying for him. I know that he knows that, and I do that every day, and I'm going to do that. That's my mission, right? That's why it's not just a role that we have. It's not our job. It's not our role. Here's another thing it's not. It's not our vision for the future, right? That's how purpose and mission and vision continue to be interconnected. Those are different things. Mission focuses on action, right? It's the thing we're supposed to be doing. Vision focuses on results. Vision should happen because of what we're doing. Best definition I've ever heard of vision came from a guy who was my pastor for the longest time. His name is Dan Green. We're not related. But he said this. I'll steal it. Vision is a picture of the future that produces passion for the present, right? Vision's a picture of the future that should produce passion for us right now. It should spur us on to action. That's what will cause us to work on our mission so that we can see the vision fulfilled, right? And we've got a phenomenal vision here at OCC but it's a future vision, right? We say as a church, we want to join God where he's at work. He's the one who saves people. He's the one who draws people to himself, but we would want to join him where he's at work, starting right here 
in the LC Valley, at our workplace, in our family, whatever, and then spreading throughout the world. That's a great vision because that's something we can see take place tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. That's a phenomenal cause. So what I want us to do today, every time we get together, I want to study God's word. I want to see how this plays out in the Bible. There are tons of practical examples that should help us engage as a local church today. So with our structured time, I kind of want to jump in and say, can we see what Jesus' mission was? And we'll jump around the Gospels a good little bit. If you got a Bible, you can try and catch up. We'll have this on the screens too. If you got your outline, a couple of the verses there. But what we see is Jesus made several mission-type statements in his life. He made statements that talked about his mission that would meet Aubrey Malford's criteria for mission, but they clearly explain why he came to the earth. Let's look at the first one, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Why did he come to the earth, Jesus? It says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. That's part of Jesus' mission. So you can see why it's so easy for us to include it as part of our mission here at OCC. We want to join God where he's at work. We want to help people serve in God's body. So as we talk about people being relationally connected, we talk about plenty of opportunities to join God, to serve out of spiritual giftedness. Does anybody think we were smart enough to come up with that on our own? No, we stole that from the Bible. Jesus wants us to serve. We steal a lot of these from the Bible, Luke 19.10. What's your mission, Jesus? For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Why does our discipleship model start in chair one? Because Jesus said to. Because he did it and we want to do it, right? This is where we're getting this stuff. Here's one that's real clear, John 18.37. Jesus appears before Pontius Pilate. Pilate said to him, so you're a king. And Jesus answered him. He said, you say that I'm a king for this purpose. What did we say about purpose? Purpose bleeds into mission. Purpose should help us define what our mission is. So Jesus says, for this purpose, I was born. For this purpose, I've come into the world. You ready? Here's my mission. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. There are a whole lot of things we can be doing in this world. Is there anything more important as disciples who make disciples, than testifying to the truth in love, (laughs) to pointing to the truth of salvation by grace through faith. Really important. Let's stop with this one. We could go on for days. We're limited by our time. John 10.10. I love this one. It starts, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. What's that? That's Satan's mission statement. Do you think if he printed it up like that and put it on cards, people would jump in so quickly? Oh, you're here to steal, kill, and destroy? Great. Let me sign up. That's his mission statement, literally right there. And people can't seem to grasp this. Jesus says, this is what I gave my life for, literally. Here's mine. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Praise the Lord. God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ and moved into our neighborhood so he could go on mission. And because of the mission that Jesus was on, defined by these mission statements where he came to save lost people, where he came to testify to the truth, where he came to bring the opportunity for people to live abundant lives once they profess faith. That that defines his mission. And so what do we see? That actually defines his ministry. That's what he went out to do over and over and over again. If you have your Bible with you, you can join along Luke chapter 4. This is a really telling passage because this shows Jesus on mission, right? And this is even before he made some of those mission-type statements we look at. But here in Luke 4, we see Jesus, and he's begun his public ministry. He's in the town of Capernaum, and he's done some miraculous healings, cool stuff. He's been driving out demons. And believe it or not, even without the internet, people heard about that. (laughs) Word of mouth, people were talking, and so that spread like wildfire. So what happened that night? Everybody's bringing you know, their sick buddies and their mother-in-laws and their demon-possessed friends and their demon-possessed mother-in-laws. And that's probably, probably not a good place for a mother-in-law joke, was it? I love my mother-in-law. But, but, but here's the deal. If, if you knew somebody was struggling, right? If you knew somebody was sick and you knew there's a guy over in the next town who could heal that person, what would you do? You'd go get that person you loved, right? And you'd bring him to this guy. So what does Jesus do? He heals a bunch of folks that evening, but not everybody. Look what happens. Verse 42 of Luke 4. And when it was day, Jesus departed, and he went into a desolate place. And the people sought him, 
and came to him and would have kept them from leaving them. Why? Because they were next in line. They had their demon-possessed mother-in-law right there, and they're like, okay, I'm next, and Jesus took off. Wouldn't you freak out? No, no, Jesus, come back. He didn't heal everybody. Why? Verse 43, he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. That's why Jesus exists. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So Jesus was there in Capernaum and he didn't preach to every person. And he didn't heal every person. What did he do? He made disciples who made disciples. And he left the disciples there. What were the disciples supposed to do? They were supposed to preach. They were supposed to point people to Jesus, right? He was trusting them with the work. Do you see how that's how he includes us today? It's the same picture. Is that a weird concept for us to try and grasp? Jesus didn't do everything he could have done. Jesus didn't heal all the sick. Jesus didn't drive out all the demons. He didn't even preach to everybody in person. What did he do? What he was sent to do. He focused on his mission. We can learn from that. Do you understand, even as a local church that is sold out to the Lord, we can't do everything. We can't do even every good thing. <laughs> that is such a temptation as a church. We want to be involved in, in so many good things. And there are tons to be involved in. But at its core, the mission of the church can't be to eradicate world hunger or eliminate poverty or make sure a certain political party is in power or, or, or make sure we're condemning people who live sinful lifestyles. When we elevate any of those agendas, some of those are very important things to talk about. But when we elevate any one of those above disciple making, that's going to distract from our mission as a church. And that's not what God desires for us. God's already got this all figured out. The idea is one person becomes a Christ follower, and God may give them a burning passion for tackling some of those issues, the homelessness issue, clean water problems, orphan care, human trafficking, it doesn't matter. That may be the burden God places on your heart, and that's fantastic. But how are you going to accomplish that? By going out and making disciples who make disciples. Because then once people's lives are changed from the inside out by God, it'd be amazing the traction you can get on these really, really important things. We have to keep the disciple making first because that's the mission that Jesus gives. Do you remember this? We, we stole our mission statement straight from the Bible. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. What are we supposed to be doing, Jesus? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What's that going to look like? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And I love the last part. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Do you recognize it? That's the mission statement God gave us here at OCC. I'm pretty sure that's the mission statement he gave every Christ follower. So as we look at Jesus' mission, we see it here in the pages of the Bible. This is going to be fun. If you have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 26. We're going to get a little preview because we're going to be there in just a couple months. But we've been watching the Apostle Paul as he's been walking through these mission journeys that God is putting him on. He understood what his mission was. Paul understood he's supposed to make disciples who make disciples. And he always kept that first. What did Paul say when people would ask him? Hey, I preach Christ and him crucified, period, right? He was going to deal with some other stuff, but he was never going to elevate that above preaching Jesus. Do we not think there were societal issues in Paul's day? Do we not think there were cultural issues or political issues? Of course there were. But he understood folks needed to know about Jesus because that's the thing that's going to help fallen people understand how to move the needle in any one of those other very important areas. And again, we'll see this in Paul's life. Acts 26. He's on trial for what? for preaching Christ and him crucified. He got thrown in court, the same thing last week in Acts 20 or 18. But, but here he's making his case before King Agrippa and he defines exactly what his mission is. This is so clear. It starts in verse 16. Jesus tells Paul, rise, stand upon your feet for I have appeared to you for this purpose. What does purpose do? It points us to mission. To appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me. And to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Why? 
Why am I being sent? God, what's the mission? You ready? Verse 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. They may turn from the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, if that's a little hard to follow, I don't typically like to do this, but I can sum this up. It's to make disciples, right? That's exactly what he's saying. You're going to help people who are blind learn who Jesus is. You're going to help people who are being confused by Satan know and understand who God is. That's the whole thing. And that's what we see Paul doing as he's walking through the Acts of the Apostles. He's keeping his mission at the forefront. There were other things he could have been addressed in. He could have talked politics all day long. He could have tried to address slavery back then. Good things. But making disciples was foremost. Making disciples is first always. And Paul got it. So when he gets to the end of his life and he knows his days are short, he's about to be martyred. What is he doing? He's pouring into his disciple, Timothy. He's making disciples who will make more disciples. This is what he says, 2 Timothy 4. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. He says, I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul finished the race. He fought the good fight. Now what did he do? Everything? No. There were a lot of things he didn't do, just like there were things Jesus didn't do, but he focused on the mission to preach Christ to lead people to him, to make disciples. And church, that's, that's what we're supposed to do as well. Again, there are tons of good things we can be involved in, but if we elevate those things above disciple making, we gotta press pause. We gotta reevaluate our focus. Jesus didn't do everything in ministry. Paul didn't do everything in ministry. When we look at our own individual ministries, we're not gonna be able to do everything. We're finite people. Every now and again, we're going to need a nap. I'm going to take one today. We can't even do all the good things we'd like to do. So we need to be able to focus and invest in things that Jesus clearly gives us a mission to do. And making disciples who make disciples is pretty clear in God's word. Now, here's the reality about it. We get it. There may be other things that we're passionate about, other things that God really places a burden on our heart. And that's great because then that platform can be where we go out to engage. God gives us this great platform because we're interested in, in trying to help solve human trafficking or world hunger. Then that can be where we go to make disciples. And then those people who are following Christ can join on that team. You'll, you'll get incredible things done. But we got to kind of bottom line this one. We're going to have the greatest influence for God when we're about the mission he has given us. And if we elevate anything above that, we are going to sidetrack ourselves for sure. The calls to make disciples. We just looked at how Jesus lived his life. We looked at how Paul lived his life. That's great. That's a fun study. The question today is, how are we going to live our lives? Are we going to invest in things that have eternal value? We to talk tomorrow night at our annual meeting about our plan for this year. Are we all going to be together on purpose and mission and vision? If the answer is yes, I want to give one more quick warning and then just one quick challenge. The warning is this, and I've already said, we got to prioritize. we got to figure out how to, how to keep the foremost things foremost so we have time and energy to devote to those. Because if we're do, too busy doing good things, we might not do the very best things. But I want to give this warning. We can even mess up and make being on mission wrong. <laughs> how? It's if we elevate the mission above the mission giver, right? This is a mistake we can make. The mission in Matthew 28 comes from who? It comes from God. It comes to us as disciples. So if we elevate the mission above the mission giver, then we're not keeping God first in our lives. And so then who are we making disciples of? Ourselves. The world doesn't need any more James Green's, <laughs> I guarantee you that. The world needs more people like Jesus. There's a great quote from a guy named Oz Guinness in his book, The Call, and he says this, we are not primarily called to do something 
or to go somewhere. We are called to someone. Amen? I love that. We are not called first to do any special work, even disciple making. We are called first to God. And so the key to answering the call is to be devoted to no one and nothing above God himself. I hope that you get a chance to come tomorrow night. If you don't, you can watch online. But you're going to see the passion of these staff guys talking about the areas where we're trying to join God. It is so exciting. We're trying to figure out how we can get everything in, and there's no way we're going to be able to do it. We we don't want to be here hours and hours and hours, but we do, right? I think God's doing incredible stuff in this local church. But it's because of the commitment we are making to join him where he's at work. But here's the deal, and I'll just say it right now. If I would try, if any person standing up here on the stage tomorrow night tries to take credit for it, then it's all wrong. None of us get the credit. We are making disciples because that's what God tells us to do. That, that's the mission. It's all about him. It's all about that relational connection. We've got to be with Jesus and point to him. And so that's really the big question. Are we interested in disciple making? Are we invested in it? My high school geometry teacher, Mrs. Schneidtree, man, she was invested. Solving geometry problems, that was her passion. That was the thing that woke her up in the middle of the night. Do we wake up in the middle of the night thinking about lost people? Do we wake up in the middle of the night thinking about helping people who are a part of the church find a way to get plugged in? I was not invested in Mrs. Schneider's geometry class. I was just interested, right? I just wanted to pass the class. Are we invested here at OCC? Now, I am so blessed because I get to meet every day with the staff. I get to serve with the ministry council, I talked to a bunch of volunteer leaders in men's ministry, women's ministry, benevolence ministry, and, and it fires me up. It is so encouraging to hear these stories from these people who are invested. They're a bunch of Mrs. Schneid trees. They're all in. They're just sold out to serving and leading in an area that literally is going to yield eternal value for God's glory. That's the difference between being interested and being invested. Do we recognize that? I'll be the illustration here today. I'm interested in losing some weight. I'm not actually losing any weight. (laughs) If I could find somebody to lose some weight for me, man, I'd be all in for that. But I'm not invested in losing any weight. I'm not engaging in it, right? That's where the change needs to happen. Here's a story about the guy who was walking down the street, not really paying attention. He fell into a hole. It's a pretty deep hole. He falls in and he gets down there and he tries to climb his way out, but the sides are real slippery. And now he realizes, dude, I'm stuck in this hole. And so what does he do? He starts yelling. (laughs) He he hears people walking by. He's like, hey, 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 I'm stuck down in this hole. Can anybody help me? And within a couple minutes, a pastor walks by. And the pastor hears all the commotion. He walks over and he kind of looks down in the hole. And here's this guy stuck down. Hey, hey, it's me. Bob, I'm stuck down in this hole. Can can you help me? And the pastor says, sure, not a problem. I'll say a prayer for you. He says a prayer for him, and he walks on along, leaves him in the hole. Is he interested or invested? Bob keeps yelling, hey, hey, I'm stuck down in this hole. And and not too much longer after that, a doctor walks by. The doctor walks over and and looks down in the hole, and and Bob can tell it's a doctor. She's wearing a lab coat or whatever, like, hey, hey, doc, can you help me? I'm stuck down in this hole. Doctor says, not a problem. Writes out a prescription, drops it in the hole, and walks on. Doctor interested or invested? And now Bob's getting a little worried, right? Bob's been in the hole for a little while. His voice is starting to give out. He's been, and now it's starting to get dark, and he's getting frantic, right? Hey, I'm stuck down in this hole. Hey. And the next thing you know, Bob's buddy Dave walks by. And Dave walks over, and he looks down in the hole. And he's like, oh, my gosh, Bob, what are you doing down in the hole? Bob says, I fell in. I'm stuck. I've been trying to get out. I, 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 there's no way for me to get out. What am I going to do? Dave says, I got you. And he jumps down in the hole with him. Is Dave interested or invested? Dave's invested. But Bob's pretty upset. Oh my goodness, Dave, what are you doing? Now we're both stuck down in this hole. What are you thinking? And Dave said, it's okay, buddy. I fell in this hole last week. I know how to get out. Do you see why we talk so much about being relationally connected? You see how we talk about locking arms in ministry? Maybe that trial that God has allowed you to go 
Maybe that trial that God has allowed you to go through taught you something that you can teach somebody else, but all you got to do is get them to follow you and not follow you. Follow you as you follow Christ because that's what disciple making is, right? That's the purpose. That's the mission. That's the vision that God is calling us to be about. Are we interested in that? Are we invested in that? Are we ready to engage? Are we going to be a church full of hole jumpers here at Orchards Community Church? Oh, I pray that we will. That's what I'm praying for you guys. That's what. That's, that's what wakes me up in the middle of the night. God bless you guys. I sure do love you. Let's pray. <sighs> Daddy, thank you. For the way you're at work in my life, I... I I remember when I gave my life to you and I remember not knowing what that looked like or, or what it was going to involve and I remember being in a, a local church back in Missouri and hearing a message like this and, and, and thinking, well, that's not for me. That's for other people. I wonder how many holes I've... I wonder how many holes I've walked by in my life and I didn't jump down and help. It wasn't long after that you had me leave my job and go on staff with Young Life. And it wasn't five years after that you had me leave that job and go on staff at my church. And nine years after that you had me leave the area I'd lived my whole life and move to a place I'd never been and relocate my family. And join you at this church where I've just been so blessed, God. Help us to invest well. Help us to grasp the purpose and the mission and the vision that you're giving us as a church so we can do this, God, for your glory because you are so worthy. God, we love you and we praise you. And we ask all that in Jesus' name. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to give to our ministry, please check out our website at lewistonocc.org. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to this podcast, as well as our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram, so you're always up to date with what's going on here at Orchards Community Church. Take care, and God bless.